Good afternoon. It is 342 Wednesday, June 17th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I am the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. Finally, we have some normalcy. People are drinking out on the street in my neighborhood. <laughs> That's good to hear. And I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. And hallelujah, the hair salons and barbers in New Jersey open next week. Not, <laughs> not a moment too soon for this awful look here. <laughs> Interesting what everyone's bringing up as far as what their go-tos are. Joe, it's it's drinking in the streets. Bill, it's getting a haircut. And I wanted to proclaim that, uh, did you guys realize that we are entering prime blueberry season? And that New Jersey is the number five output of blueberries in the United States? Did not know I that. Know. Those are Johnny Carson. I did not know that. That's right. You can't beat it. If you're Next time you pop one of those blueberries in your mouth, you'll think of that now. New Jersey is fifth in the nation. I got like three pints in the fridge. Uh, I'm Alan Cross. I'm my managing editor of the TV and I'm waiting for opening day of baseball. I'm so excited. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> we'll talk about that. We'll get into that. That Delaware Park is back and baseball is it. Yeah. TDN Writers Room is presented by Keeneland. Reminder, Keeneland will conduct an online select horses of racing age sale Tuesday, June 23rd. So that's next Tuesday, six days away in the Keeneland Digital Sales Ring. Learn more and register to bid in advance at KeenelandDigital.com. Just wanted to shout out a couple of sales graduates, Keeneland sales graduates over the weekend that did well. She's a Julie with the win in the Ogden Phipps and Neptune Storm over at Golden Gate in the San Francisco Mile. Uh, John, I know you've checked out the digital sales ring. What have, your, what have been your impressions? Yeah, it's really impressive. There's about three dozen horses that are entered into the Horses of Racing Age sale as of today. Um, and six of them actually have placed or have won graded stake races. So it's not only a good deep uh, bullpen of horses, but also some horses that have some uh, legitimate uh, track record on them and some tread on the tire. Um, you can look at their pedigrees, you can look at their rag numbers, their uh, past performances, obviously, thoroughgraph. And a lot of the uh, entries also have updated photos and videos as well as uh, videos of the confirmation, as well as videos of them racing. So, you know, tip of the hat to Keeneland for uh, putting together this great program and product. Um, first time we're going to have an online only sale. And uh, it's just, it, it's up to Keeneland's usual standards. It's phenomenal. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty groundbreaking. And I think it's the way the industry is going forward. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I'm looking forward to John Green getting even richer next week. So there's always that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the reason why you should go to the, the, the sale, right? Exactly. Give John Green money. <laughs> All right. We will start this week with the first leg of the Triple Crown, which is currently three days away. We had the draw earlier today for the Belmont Stakes, the mile and an eighth Belmont Stakes. We have a 10 horse field. It is the law. My lone hope in the uh, fantasy stable contest. Since everyone else has dropped out, we might do a supplemental draft in the near future about that since we've lost so many. In these uh, in these early weeks of the contest, but uh, so Tis the Law is true post eight. He's the six to five morning line favorite. Like I said, field of ten. He's followed out by uh, Doctor Post and Pneumatic Brian uh, Donato's gruesome twosome in the. Uh, he actually he has Max Player too, so Max he's got a three. He's got, the, he's got yeah. all three. So I need I need Tis Law to, to crush all of them. Um, but nice field to tap it to win. Who's on? Who's coming back on relatively short rest? Ran a hole in the win opening week at Belmont. Sole Volante is going to be in there too. Uh, a couple of other interesting horses on the undercard. We have the uh, five horse Woody Stevens, but it's it's a pretty solid field for five horses. You've got Echo Town, Mischievous Alex, Maru, um, no paroles in there. Nine Ridge, seven horses. Friend of the show, John Green's got a horse in there. Proven Strategies in the three hole. Uh, Wonder again, also pretty short field, five horses. Then you've got the Acorn, which has seven horses, headed by Gamine. Um, and then the Jiper is the one I'm forgetting eight horses in there, grade one Jiper stakes. So, you know, not super big fields, which is a little shocking to me, honestly, in, in terms of how the racing product has been so far at Belmont, but it's still a tremendous day of racing, no longer met mile day as, as I referred to it in the past. Um, so we're going to have to wait on that, but, uh, we'll get, we'll start with Bill and we'll just get your takes on the Belmont stakes. I think I know who Bill likes. Yeah, I mean, I hate to be boring, but how can you not like Tis the Law? I mean, he's the proven commodity. He's very good horse. Everything has gone right for him getting into this race. You have all these other big name horses that dropped out. You know, I, I don't want to uh, be, you know, uh, uh, killjoy here, but 
I just don't feel much buzz. Um, and, you know, I, it's not anybody's fault. It, you know, the way this thing worked out, everything went wrong. You have the virus, you have the whole triple crown being uh, mixed around. Then you have a bunch of horses get hurt uh, and, and not go in the Belmont. You know, it, it really is tis the law versus a bunch of horses that, you know, have to prove that they're of that quality. I, I can tell right now, I'm talking to a bunch of people yesterday, Dr. Post is the wise guy horse. Absolutely. The Todd Butcher horse. But it, again, it could not be more boring for me to say this, but I really don't see if he went, runs his race, why Tis Law wouldn't win this. And then, you know, then Joe Bianca is off to winning our fantasy contest wire to wire. No one will catch him. It's interesting that you look at the, uh, the 10 horses that are in the race right now. And even as early as last week, there were like we thought there'd be nine or 10 horses in there, but four, four horses or so kind of flip flop. And four horses that we thought were going to be running in the race got hurt, got sick, or, or passed on the race. And all of a sudden, I think, you know, the Naira probably did a great job of canvassing other trainers and saying, this is going to be a five or six horse field. You should really get your horse in here because it's still 150 points to win. Um, and, and it's a winnable race, you know, around this uh, nine furlong uh, race. Um, I agree, Bill, with what you're saying about, you know, Tis the Law is definitely the, the, the horse to beat. Dr. Post was one that I had marked, um, you know, as hopefully for my second round that Brian stole. I'm fortunate that I have two horses in here, but I think it's really just, um, you know, the other horses kind of satelliting around, um, you know, tis the law. I mean, the, 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 the horse is coming home to roost. He won on this racetrack before, and there's a reason why he's probably going to be, I think Post, when he's now six to five, but he's probably going to go off at three to five in this race, and rightfully so. Alan, if you don't mind, let me uh, jump in here real quick because I want to piggyback off what something John said. John, you the way you phrased it, but you didn't use the words, is this is a prep for the Kentucky Derby. And you, you talked about the points. And I, I don't think you're wrong in that. I think a lot of people are looking at it that way. And again, nobody's fault. There's nothing you can do about it. But that whole notion that this is not you know, a, a huge deal, it is in fact a prep for the Kentucky Derby, no different than maybe the Travers or Haskell, is the reality this year. And obviously, you know, that makes it, I'm sorry to say, a little bit less special than a normal Belmont Stakes, especially, if, you know, if somebody's going for the Triple Crown or a normal Triple Crown race of any sort. So, uh, and, but I think you're right. I, I mean, when, if, when Tizalaw wins, when he wins on Saturday, everybody would go up to Barkley Tag and say, how, how are you set up now for the Kentucky Derby? So anyway, really sorry, Alan. Put you're put on me. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. And I think um, Barkley said after the draw that he'd have preferred something between five and seven. Uh, he's drawn eight, but he's outside. I think he lands in third and sort of parks outside of Tappet to win and four left. So he's going to get a cushy trip. He should be able to stay out of trouble. He's going to get first run on those horses. And then it remains to be seen if a Sol Volante can, can come get him uh, or something like that. Um, I think four left his addition to the race. I would have loved him in the Woody Stevens. Um, I, I think a mile and beneath is, is stretching his stamina. Um, so I, I, he's an outsider, but he's going to have, I think he's going to have played some sort of role in, in the way the map, the race maps out. So Tizzle is going to sit off of, off of them and, and get first run. He's probably going to be too good for them. I am. Um, I have a little hunch on, on modernist. I think he's going to, he's not going to be, as speedy as the speediest. And he's going to sit second flight. Um, he wants every bit of this trip. I think the one turn mile and eighth emphasizes a staying nine for long horse, which I think modernist is. Uh, Tis the law fits that category as well. I like modernist as a, as a potential exotics crasher. And I think pneumatic can, uh, can, can run, uh, crash the, the trifecta, let's say. So um, I, I agree with Bill that it lacks a certain buzz, but it is a triple crown race. It's the nature of the beast this year. And, and let's just get it on. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. I'm going to, I'm going to have a little uh, essay and video piece this weekend about the Belmont. And it's more about what the Belmont being back represents rather than the actual field and the actual horses itself that are in the race. Cause I agree with you guys that it's not, it's not a super sexy field and like the card in general, like there's a lot of, a lot of good horses, but no, I don't know, no, really, like, no, like 14 horse war is like we're used to seeing on Belmont Stakes Day. I'm glad that Al brought up the one term mile and an eighth, too, because that's not a distance that they run a ton of races at, at Belmont. It's like pretty much just the Peter Pan on the dirt going a mile and an eighth in that one turn. 
occasionally you'll get like a 10 furlong turf race that gets washed off and they'll run it at that uh, mile and an eighth distance. But it's really interesting because it's, it's, it, to me, it's kind of like a European race. And I'm going to get to Al's thoughts on Royal Ascot in a little bit. But it's where these, they have these long straightaway races with no turns. That Belmont is such a long run going into that, that far it's turn that I just think there's, there's so much chance for, for maneuvering and for gamesmanship and, and, and jockeying. And I just think that makes it a little bit more interesting uh, just because you really got it. You really got to time your move, right? You know, there's so it's such a big, this big sweeping far turn as we know, but there's such a long run up to the far turn that you really got to, you really got to reserve and preserve your horse. Um, you know, even before you get to that turn, you really want to sit halfway through the turn. You probably want to sit, but it, it makes it a scramble. I think more so than the two turn uh, Belmont stakes norm that, that would be normally run at. Um, so I think the posts in this race are kind of meaningless. I think, you know, you could be drawn anywhere. If you break well, if you get a good spot early, you're going to be in a good position going into the far turn. So um, that part of it is interesting because they don't run that many races at Belmont in that configuration. So, and I think that's a lot why a lot of people, you know, kind of downplay it as, as a fake classic because it is only that one turn mile and eighth. And I, I get that, but you know, it's the triple crown. And you, if you rewinded two, two months and you said Belmont, Churchill, Santa Anita, every big track is going to be back running in mid June. And we're going to have a full on Belmont stakes day. You would assign for that in a heartbeat. So I agree with you guys, not the, not, not the most glamorous field, but it is the Belmont stakes. It is the triple crown. And we came a long way to get here. So like Al said, let's get it on. Um, before, before we uh, move on from that discussion, I did want to make use of Al here, our, our resident Euro expert. Uh, Royal Ascot started the other day on Tuesday and already seen some pretty good performances. Um, unfortunately, we don't we won't get to see Enable at this stand. She's going to wait for the Coral Clips. Um, Al, what have been your early impressions and what are you looking forward to most the rest of the week at Royal Ascot? You know, it's kind of funny. Um, I'm usually very, very psyched for Royal Ascot and and similar to Belmont, it just it lacks a buzz. I don't know if it's because there's no no fans on, on site. Um, you know, it's weird. Like Royal Ascot all, almost always starts nine thirty is, is the first race of the day. Nine nine o'clock is the is the uh, the royal procession, and and none of that's happening, obviously. So, um, I mean, like for me, it lacks a little bit of the buzz as well. But there was a breakout performance today by a horse called the Lord North. Uh, John Gosden, a uh, Dubawi Colt, um, just ran away from them in the uh, in the Prince of Wales Estate. That's the uh, main mile and a quarter race of, of the meet. Uh, Jim Crowley is first call rider for Shadwell. He's having an outstanding meet. He's got four winners over the first two days. Uh, I'm looking forward to to sharing in in the Coronation Stakes. Um, we'll see what she can do. I think it's a sporting gesture for. Her. Um, Eclipse and Gainesway and Grand Motion to send her over there. Um, you know, it's not a race where American horses have have excelled. Of course, uh, you know, Teppin went over and, and did her thing a few years ago. But it's it's hard to understate how difficult a task that is. Um, the shipping and and the undulating course and and the competition and um, but it gives us something to you know sink our teeth into in, in a few days' time. Uh, Wesley Ward had a couple in the uh, Windsor Castle Stakes today. Uh, neither ran particularly well. I think they finished eighth and ninth. Uh, Sheriff Bianco and um, a Ramsey horse's name escapes me at the moment. But, um, but you know, the same way as this is the Triple Crown, and this is Royal Ascot, and uh, it's exciting time of the year. And uh, that would be a great story for Graham. Obviously, he's from Great Britain for him to come back and, and win such a big race there. And I'm, I'm a personally a sharing fan. I made her a rising star. And then two days later, saw that the buyer was like 64. So I felt terrible about it. And then she obviously went on to do some good things. Um, again, similar to Arrogate, should have crushed her in the British Cup. Juvenile Billy Star had like 20 bucks on her. Uh, but just to set this, this, the scene for the rest of the week, obviously, we went through the Belmont um, races. Tomorrow, we got the, the two and a half mile gold cup. At Royal Ascot. And then Friday, we've got the Commonwealth Cup, which is a group one going six furlongs. Um, then the Albany Stakes for two year old Phillies, the Norfolk Stakes for two year old Colts. And then Saturday closes out with the Coronation Stakes, which Al mentioned, the uh, St. James's Palace, which is a mile 
for three-year-old Colts on the turf, the Queen Mary, five furlongs for two-year-old Phillies, and the Diamond Jubilee Group 1 for sprinters uh, going six furlongs. Other than that, there's a little bit of action at Churchill Downs. There's the Wise Dan. There's the Audubon Stakes for three-year-olds going seven furlongs, or rather nine furlongs, excuse me, on the turf. Um, but yeah, so still a ton to look forward to, even if the, in, in the particular fields don't tickle your fancy. There's still a lot to watch, and Saturday is going to be a jam-packed day of racing, and, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, so yeah, let's do it. <laughs> we'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. This week's news is sponsored by West Point Thoroughbreds. Owning a multiple grade stakes winning racehorse like Hard Not to Love is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtv.com. So plenty of action for West Point this week, as, as for all of us. They came away with the from the OBS Spring Sale with Colts by Ironicus, Munnings, not this time, and Union Red. So they, they've got to be happy with that kind of diversity and just to be in the in the buying sphere again is, is a big thing for everybody, for all ownerships and partnerships. And they got some action on Belmont Stakes Day as well. They got Kentaka in the grade one Jiper Stakes. Uh, he is now with Graham Motion, first run with, with that barn. And decorated invader in the grade two Penine Ridge, the legendary Penine Ridge, who Bill loves so much. <laughs> um, one of them, one, one of them was a two-year-old purchase, purchase. The other one was bought as a yearling. So nice little balance for their representatives for one of the real big days of the racing season. So best of luck to the crew at West Point. Uh, we'll be watching and rooting for you guys as much as our journalistic integrity will allow us to. Um, so best of luck, and we're, we're happy to see those two-year-olds starting to run as well. Uh, so we got, a, we got a little smattering of news this week. Obviously, the Belmont takes up most of the headlines and Royal Ascot as well. Uh, we did have the OBS spring sale, the first major sale uh, completed last week since the virus hit. Um, we're going to talk to Mark Taylor in a little bit and get his impressions about the market. Um, wanted to give a congratulations to John Green and Brian DiDonato, who came away with a horse by Munnings last week, who, who went nine and four fifths. Looks pretty fast. So Shout out to you guys as well. Um, but I'm going to pass it over to John and just get some brief impressions from him on the market and what its outlook is going forward as we enter sale season once more. Yeah, you know, thanks. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. You know, the, the sale was really difficult to handicap um, it, it going into it because not only were a lot of people uh, sidelined and not being able to travel, um, not just internationally, but, but within the United States, but they had really goofy weather. Um, it was raining. It was hailing. There were, you know, 100 degree days, uh, heat index, locusts, dogs and cats living together. It just wasn't a good, you know, overall uh, week for them to, uh, to be watching horses and walking around and looking at horses. Um, that being said, when, when the sale was done, the numbers came out and it looked like it was pretty comparable to last year. But when you really dig deep and you look to see, um, you know, how many horses actually changed hands, uh, there were roughly about 48% of the horses that actually sold. Um, that were cataloged, which isn't a great percentage. That means a lot of people still have money, uh, you know, tied up into, uh, into horses. Um, if you take the supplement numbers out of the entire uh, spring sale, um, the the gross goes down from fifty eight point seven million to forty seven million, um, which is roughly down thirty five percent from where it was last year, and the average went down from last year it was one hundred eight thousand. Uh, this year, they're saying it was 93,000, which is a decrease of 14%. But again, when you take out the supplement horses that came in from the Miami sale, um, the averages are really down closer to 26%. So you say, well, why is that? Because they still had a number of horses that sold for a lot of money, including a, uh, um, not this time that, that uh, the top of the sale and a quality road that sold for over a million dollars, a spice search sold for over a million dollars. And I really think it shows the um, worldwide overall valuation of these horses. And when you can't get people coming in from 
Japan or from Korea or even from the islands to act as kind of a, a buffer or at least an initial bidding um, you know, group, it really does affect that, that lower to middle market. The upper market didn't need any help. There were a lot of people there that could raise their hand at buying horses for 250, 300, 500, you know, even a million dollars. But that level of horse, uh, you know, in that normally in that 50 to 75 range really suffered. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of horses that are going to resurface, I think, in the July OBS sale um, and probably sell without any kind of a reserve. So I think the Pinnacles overall are a little nervous. Um, you can look at it as that's a great out buying opportunity for the upcoming Maryland sale um, because maybe people will be selling without reserve or if you're willing to take a little bit off on pedigree or maybe a little bit of a vet consideration, you can get some great value, I think. Um, for this upcoming sale. And quite frankly, that's why, even though I've been pounding my chest saying, we're not going to buy, we're not going to buy, we're not going to buy. When we looked at it as businessmen, we said, wow, this is a great opportunity for, uh, for us to come in and maybe you know, buy a couple of great candidates. Um, so just before we move on from the sale chat, and we, we appreciate John's insights, uh, we do have the Mid-Atlantic two-year-olds in training sale, which John referenced, which is going to be July or June 29th and 30th in Timonium. And then we're going to have what was the OBS June sale is going to be in July. Um, it's going to be July 14th, 15th, and 16th. It's the July two-year-olds and horses of racing age sale. And then after that, we will transition into yearling season as, as we get to the fall. Um, so yeah, a little too early to draw too many conclusions. Obviously, the, at the events of the past couple of months have really hampered the market a little bit. But I agree with John, just from my novice opinion, that it is a buyer's market, at least for right now. And there are opportunities abound. And I think the horse that you guys bought is a prime example of that. I think in a normal situation, she would have gone for considerably more than that. So wish you guys the best. And, and, and I agree with, uh, with most of your points. The other big news of this week is something that we're definitely going to argue about, which we've argued about before on this show. And it's the, uh, the new whip rules that have now been um, agreed upon in California and Kentucky. Now in California, the rule now is that you can't strike a horse more than two times in succession without giving them a chance to respond. And overall, it's you can only hit them underhanded, um, and it's you can only hit them six times throughout the entire race. So in and in, in Kentucky, I'm looking at it right now in today's TDN. Uh, it says the riding crop being used at any time without penalty, if in the opinion of the stewards, the riding crop is used to avoid a dangerous situation or preserve the safety of other riders or horse in the race. That will be allowed. Tapping the horse on the shoulder with the crop in the down position while both hands are holding onto the reins and both hands are touching the neck of the horse will be allowed and showing or waving the whip will be allowed. But overall, much more restrictive policies. Um, I'm not going to I'm not gonna bang on the table about this. Bill had some good stuff from from uh, Jerry Bailey and his, and his week in review this past week about his opinions and how they've changed um, since he was becoming a writer. Uh, I know how you guys feel, but what do you think? Do you think this is far enough or do you think? You know, like Jerry Bailey said, you might not have to get rid of the, the whip entirely. Well, I could talk about this all day. And, you know, damn it, let's just tear the Band-Aid off. I mean, these half measures are not doing anybody any good. And, you know, again, I can talk about it all day long, but I'm just going to say this very simple sentence. because I think it sums everything up. In 2020, when dog racing has been put out of business, the circus has been put out of business, SeaWorld has been put out of business. That tells you what the American society feels about animals and how human beings treat them. We hit the animal with a whip to make them go faster. I will open the floor to anybody else. Please explain to me why that's a good idea. Well, I mean, I from, my, yeah, I mean from, from my perspective, look, I, I'll, I'll, first of all, as, as a better, I just, I don't think if you, watch, if you watch these races and a horse and a jockey drops the whip, it's a completely different horse. It's a completely different animal. Do I think there should be more restrictions on it? I think that that makes sense. But a lot of the a lot of the arguments I see against the whip are anecdotal. Like Jerry Bailey said something in the in the article about, oh well, I've heard from people who have said like, oh, they don't like the whip, They're, and that's what's keeping them away from from the sport. I don't buy that, and I have yet to see any data that says that that says that's the sticking point. For people who would have otherwise gotten into racing and don't because of, because of the whip, I agree with you guys that optically it's not great for for a casual observer. But I just I think it's so anecdotal to say that that's what's keeping people from being participants in racing. And I just 
I don't know. I, I defer to the jockeys a lot on this too, because the jockeys are almost unanimously against getting rid of the whip. They're the ones on the backs of the horse. So there's either, there's two explanations for why the jockeys don't want to get rid of the whips. A, they're cruel and they get off on the cruelty of hitting an animal or B, they think that it helps with the safety and the control of the animal. Now, I don't think that, I don't think that it's A. I don't think that they're all Roman chap out there and they just love beating the animal. So that would be my opinion on it. I would defer mostly to the people who are on the horse's back and what they think. Well, uh, you know, there's many ways to answer that. First of all, they can still use the whip for safety measures. Nobody said to take that away. Even if you you get rid of these silly rules, you can strike them one and a half times and and but you better not do it three times in a row and, and, and all that kind of nonsense. But first, nobody said that they have to take the whips away from them for, for safety measures. And Joe, I, I mean, look, I, I've never ridden a horse in my life. I don't know anything about that. Uh, but, you know, the uh, you, you look at it, it just doesn't make any sense. And you talk about what Jerry Bailey said, where, you know, it's not a safety concern. You use the reins to steer the horse. I mean, then I would say, look, if you're that concerned about it, um, let's, you know, have a six month trial. And if it's, it's, you know, bedlam and there's, there's, you know, horses running all over the place and, and all that sort of thing, then, okay, you've proven your point. But to me, and again, of course, I don't know firsthand from this, but these are just people are, people don't like change and they're creatures of habit. And they, every single one of them, since they first jumped on a horse when they were 11 years old and weighed 45 pounds, have had this thing, this whip in their hands, and they don't feel comfortable doing without it. I, I understand that. I mean, I know it's a, you know, a, hardly a major racing country, but Norway, they don't allow whips. Nothing happens there. Uh, you know, people say, oh, the handle's going to go way down. Well, Woodbine put in these rules last year where they, they restricted the whipping. It didn't affect handle one bit. Um, you know, and Jerry Bailey's as smart as any jockey I've ever talked to in my life. And he says that the horses, he, he said, he said to me, one in 500 horses need a whip to run faster. So, you know, and again, will it, does it, does it destroy racing that we have a whip? No. But there are definitely people out there that look at this sport as barbaric. And, you know, why would you do anything to help them feed into that image of it? You know, look, we all hate PETA. We all think they're full of SHIT. But, you know, they have a lot of people that listen to them. You know, people in government listen to them. And why are we giving them fuel for their arguments by, again, whipping the animal? That's all you need to know. We whip the animal. That's not okay. Case closed. I mean, Jerry did also say in the piece that he agrees that the padded crops do not hurt the horse. So I kind of think that this is a little bit of just throwing your hands up and admitting that you cannot educate the public on this. You know, you're just going to let them set the narrative in terms of whether or not the horses are being abused, which they aren't by the whip. I think the safety issues and the breakdowns like that is a much bigger issue. And that's a much bigger barrier to people getting into racing, because that is truly awful to see a horse break down on a track can be incredibly traumatic. Like even for someone, even for someone who's a veteran like me, like I've seen it once or twice and it breaks my heart. It makes me sick. I mean, maybe I'm just, you know, inured to the whip at this point, but I just think that that's a much bigger issue and that, you know, changing the entire game and from a jockey's perspective, because of optics, I just, I don't, I don't know that that's the right course of action. I think, you know, if you want to make it more restrictive, we can see how that goes. And that that's, you know, that's reasonable enough, but I just think to say we're going to take this thing away from the sport that we a admit does not hurt the animal and B has been around for hundreds of years and we've conditioned horses and jockeys to respond to it. I just think that's a little too easy just to, to give it up like that. But we're going to disagree. All right. First of all, Carrasso and Green need to jump in here and help me. On this. But, I got something. No, you, Don't worry. The you just gave the best unwittingly. You gave the best argument there is. You said we shouldn't public set the narrative. No, of course we should let the public set the narrative. What you think about this doesn't matter. What John Green thinks about this doesn't matter. What John Velasquez thinks about this doesn't matter. Or what Jerry Bailey thinks about this doesn't matter. The public does set the narrative for horse racing because the public perception of the sport is what matters. One of the dumbest things the Jockeys Guild said in this is, oh, they, they said they're doing this to keep Sacramento happy. Uh, and they said that's ridiculous. Of course you should keep Sacramento happy. You know, we're seven months ago, we we're on this doing this podcast talking about the governor, Gavin Newsom of that state, shutting the sport down. Nothing is more important than keeping Sacramento happy because they have the ability to do whatever you want to the sport. And, you know, look, you know, you talked about you said he's been doing 200 years. 
Well, you know, 200 years ago, you know, the people got from point A to point B in, in horse and buggy. And 50 years ago, and even I'm so, so old to admit it, when I was in college, I turned in my term papers on a freaking typewriter. Society changes. Things happen. They move on. You know, we're going to go do something because that's the way they did it in 1847 at Morris Park when your great, great granddaddy was, you know, trying to pick a winner. I, you know, again, uh, it just uh, and I agree with you that it probably doesn't hurt the horse and it's not that big a deal. And I also agree with you that the breakdowns are a much, much bigger issue. But that's not what we're talking about right now. I think this is an easy fix to help horse racing's perception. And it's time has come to do it. It's going to happen anyways. You know, whether it takes 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, it's going to happen. Like I said, enough of these silly rules that you can do it one time underhanded and you have to, you know, sing Mary had a little lamb before you can hit the horse again a second time. Let's just do this and move on with it. I mean, you know, it's just it's the right thing to do. Um, guys, I appreciate the opportunity to say something, especially, you know, under the precursor that it doesn't really mean anything as per Bill Finley. So it's it's OK. <laughs> what I think but that being said. We've been fortunate enough to win grade one races with whips and grade one races where the jockeys haven't had whips. Um, and I can't honestly tell you out of the 25,000 races that we've run in between, if, if it really hurts a horse, if it helps, you know, can coax a horse for that last, you know, 20 yards or anything in between. This whole point of, of the whip rules, um, Bill, I will agree with you a thousand percent that it is just window dressing. Joe, I will agree with you a thousand percent that it is just optics. And both of it is meaningless because if the industry really wants to focus on an important topic, it's not going to be on the whip rules and whether or not, you know, like Bill said, it needs to be Mary had a little lamb between, between smacks. It's got to be focusing on the medication rules, on the people who cheat and on all the other things that nobody wants to talk about because the whip rule, quite frankly, is just shuffle on the deck on the Titanic. Who gives a crap? about if it doesn't, if it really doesn't affect a horse, really doesn't hurt a horse. And it really doesn't help a jockey steer, you know, in times of peril where, where he or she needs to have, you know, the crop in order to be able to really manage a, you know, 1200 or a thousand pound animal. Then what are we talking about? Why are we even getting into this discussion? If it makes racing look better, get rid of the freaking whip. If it doesn't help, you know, a jockey anyway, then get rid of it because the optics are great. But can we please focus on the more important things that are going on in horse racing? Because otherwise, this is much to do about nothing. Now, I guess the issue I have, particularly with the, the CHRB and their decision, is how they apparently left the jockeys. I mean, they mentioned um, consulting with Mike Smith and Aaron Greider. Um, like Alex Elise was one of the dissenting voters. Uh, it was four to two was the vote. Alex Silis was one of the dissenters. So I, I still don't know why, um, if they ask for another couple of weeks, I understand this thing's dragged on months and months and months. Um, but what, what harm would it have done to, to say, we'll take this up in two weeks' time, we'll consult with, with jockeys across the board? Um, I, I don't know what, what damage that would have done. Also, I, arguably, the customer is. The number one problem, and I understand. I, I read the, your Woodbine piece from last year about the handle being unaffected. But if the perception among the gambling public is that by taking the whip or by restricting its use that you're decreasing your chances of winning, I can't see where that's not going to create some backlash long term. And so I, I'd be con concerned about about that. As well, there are umpteen countries around the world that have um, these whip rules in place. Ryan Moore just got a, a whip infraction yesterday for for raising the whip above shoulder level. Um, so enforce it. Um, have these have these rules in place. Be strict about it. You know, have stewards do their job for once and enforce enforce penalties and and try to get the, the riders to, to adhere. But I, I personally am not a fan of the idea of no whips. Um, I can live with restricting the use to an underhand or um, you know, in certain disciplinary cases. But Bill, I have a question for you. In, in standard bread racing, is there a comparison? Is there a one-to-one -one comparison in how they use 
the whip. And isn't it the noise that the whip makes against the buggy that motivates the horse? You know, I'm not really sure about that, Alan, exactly what they do, but they also have restricted a lot of the rules and, you know, same sort of thing. Um, you know, those guys are mainly hitting the horse forwardly like that. And, you know, I, again, I, I haven't been covering harness racing as closely as I have for, uh, over the last couple of years, but there are a lot of rules for that as well. You know, sort of like the Mary had a little lamb rules that they have now going to have at Santa Anita and, and whatnot, at least in the future that, you know, restricting it again for the optics and that sort of thing. You know, they don't, the guys can't wail on the horses like they might have, you know, Stanley Dancer at Yonkers Raceway in 1968 or something like that. But, um, you know, I mean, it's it's similar to, to thoroughbred racing that uh, and, and I would agree with exactly what John said that, you know, I don't think it's, a, the, you know, on anybody's top 10 list of major problems in, in the sport. But, you know, we're talking about it. The CRHRB is talking about it. And I just think, you know, uh, any people can disagree with me a lot, do, But I just think that, you know, the way I look at it is more from an outsider's viewpoint. And you know, one thing is, um, you know, I don't want to get personal in here, but my daughter will not uh, will not have anything to do with horse racing because of whips. And, you know, she's 19 years old. And, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, ever their 19 year olds don't pay any attention to horse racing. And if they did, I think they might come up with the same, you know, perception. And, you know, I'll say it again and again and again. We whip the animal. <laughs> Not a good idea. I mean, I would just like to see the data, you know, and I, I agree with Al's point that, you know, at this point, the, the priority should be, you know, satisfying the people that are already putting money into the game. And we're hemorrhaging. Horse players, like handle is going down. Horse players are leaving the industry. And if you can show me data that says handle is going to increase this much, there's going to be this many people that would bet on horse racing, but aren't going to because the whip is there. Then I'm all Then I would agree. I would say, yeah, like, let's get rid of the whip. If this is going to bring in new customers to the sport, I'm with you. But I just have not seen that data. And it just, it all seems anecdotal to me. And I just, you know, to follow up on John's point, you would think, you know, listening to people in racing for the past 10 years that the biggest problems in the sport are the whip and Lasix. And I just, you can't follow the sport on a day-to-day -day basis and possibly think that that's the case. It's just, I know we're not, we're contributing to it because we're talking about it for so long, but it just, <laughs> it, it takes up so much of the air in the discussions of how to improve the sport. And it's, to me, it's mostly window dressing. Uh, Joe, I don't necessarily disagree with you about that, but, you know, uh, I don't, handle's not going to go down if you take the whip away. And, you know, it's a small sample size, but we already have the Woodbine example to look at. And it, look, you know, it's about being on a level playing field. You know, if horse A doesn't have a whip and horse B doesn't have a whip and they're, you know, neck and neck at the 16th pole, that's all you ask is that they're on a level playing field. And, you know, again, I, I he's only one voice, but I go again by what Jerry Bailey says, that is 30,000 times he rode a racehorse, he never once felt that, that you know, he was losing anything uh, if he didn't whip a horse or that his horse was going to necessarily run faster. Uh, I think we probably exhausted this subject. So, yeah. Yeah. Jerry also said, said, you don't want to say we beat this to death because then that would encourage whipping. Go ahead, Al. Um, you know, go ahead, Al. I, <laughs> that would be I thought, out, don't worry. <laughs> I thought it was interesting at a minimum that Jerry said to you, Bill, that um, since he's been, I mean, he's been retired, what, 14 years. Um, that almost assuredly he'd, he'd have a different viewpoint or, or had a different viewpoint when he, when he was riding races. Like, well, uh, yeah. And I think that's interesting and pertinent because, you know, look, horse racing is such an insular world and, you know, the people involved in horse racing by and large don't really circulate among the rest of the world and, and, and people outside. It's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, but it is the nature of horse racing that it's so insular. And I think in his years away from the racetrack and being a commentator on NBC, he's, able to see it from a perspective that is not so much of the race tracker, but it's more someone who does circulate, uh, you know, among the, the, the more the masses and, and, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, uh, again, I, if I had a thousand people tell me they think horse racing is awful because they whip horses, of course not. But I have heard from people, especially younger people. And uh, whether I've heard from a thousand people or five people, again, you know, we look at, this is not 1962. And we have to look at where society is now in its view on animals' welfare and how human beings treat them. And look, there's no denying that people are very conscious of this subject. And, and horse racing is suffering because of this, much more so the breakdowns and the doping 
than the whip. I yes, I agree with that. But you lump all this in together, and the perception of horse racing is god awful in this country right now, worse it's ever been. And anything we can do to make it better, but, you know, we caught Navarro in service. We're going to go twenty years before we catch anybody else. Um, you know, breakdowns are always going to happen. We're getting better, but you know, twenty years from now, we're still doing this podcast. We're going to be talking about, you know, oh my God, the rash of breakdowns at so and so downs wasn't it awful? So those things are almost impossible to fix. But the whipping is something you can do, and it's a step in the right direction. You know, I feel I felt I felt that way for the longest time, and I'm adamant about that. Yeah, no, and and that's fine. At least you're consistent on it. But I think to your point that that this kind of stuff lets the decision makers and the powers that be on racing off the hook for not doing anything about juicers and not doing anything about breakdowns because this is so easy, relatively speaking. This is a very easy thing to do to make it look to the public like you're making the sport safer and more humane. It's a lot harder to catch the cheaters as we've seen by the FBI having to come in and do our dirty work for us. So I just, I think it's a little bit of a red herring to say, look, here's what we're doing to make the sport safer. Meanwhile, you got 30% trainers rampant across the country and, you know, horses breaking down. So I just, I think it's an easy thing to be like, oh yeah, look at all the things we're doing for the sport and the horse's safety when we're not really doing what we should be doing. We're not really making the horses safer and we're not cleaning up the game. So it's, I, I respect your opinion, but I just think it's, it's, it's an easy thing to do, you know, for optics and we're not really fixing the core problems in the sport. Joe, I don't disagree with that. I really don't. So. All right. We came to an agreement after like 20 minutes. <laughs> Glad. <laughs> um. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. Green Group Guest of the Week this week, returning champion, vice president of TaylorMade Sales, TaylorMade Stallions, Mark Taylor. Thanks so much for joining us again. Thanks a lot, Joe. I'm, uh, I'm glad you guys asked me to be on. Absolutely. Um, we just thought you, as, as a prominent consigner, we thought you would be great to talk to as the sales season starts to ratchet up again. Obviously, we had OBS spring last week. So my first question is, seemed like business was down and it seemed like that was pretty much predicted by most people. I'll ask you to put on your economic forecasters hat here. Do you think that that's going to be a trend through the rest of the year and going forward or do you think it'll pick back up? Well, I think that it's going to be a trend. I don't, I don't see any scenario where we can, uh, you know, not the market's not going to be off from 2019. I think just everything that we've been through, um, it, it's just too much to overcome, not to expect, you know, some decline. I was actually relieved a little bit from the OBS results. I thought that it could have been worse. Um, if you look at those two year old sales, especially, um, you know, what used to be OBS April. With the high volume of horses they have there, it's not a, a small boutique sale like you know the Gulfstream sale or whatever. You really rely on a lot of those foreign buyers um, that come in, South Americans, Koreans, and and those type of people um, to pick up a lot of those horses. And with you know tr some travel restrictions, logistical problems, and just fear factor, um, you know I think that the participation from those groups were you know noticeably down. And, you know, that, that's really a, a struggle. We need those buyers. So anyway, I thought it could have been worse. Um, and, you know, the two-year-olds, two-year-old pinhookers, definitely, uh, they had to work for everything they got. It wasn't easy, but um, I feel like, uh, you know, it kind of bode a little bit more optimism for me as we get our feet back under us moving forward. 
Hey, Mark, it's Bill Finley, and thanks for joining us and uh, really appreciate your insights. If you could now put on your tailor-made stallions hat, uh, one of the bright spots at this sale was how the stallion, tailor-made stallion, not this time, was received. And it, it was received fantastically, and especially for a horse that didn't even get to run as a three-year-old and, and, you know, kind of was under the radar a little bit in his racing career. Just your take on, on his crop selling so well, and uh, was it uh, somewhat of a pleasant surprise? Yeah, well, it, it was it, it was fantastic. Um, you know, when you're in the um, when you're in the stallion game, um, you know that that's what really breathes uh, hope into your whole organization. When you can get a horse that's starting to gain momentum, and you think you know there's a lot of blue sky there. So um, you know, as far as whether it was a surprise, you know, not this time has been this horse that's had a cult following from the time that we got him. Um, you know, we're very grateful to uh, the Alba organization. Uh, they've had his mother with us, uh, Miss Macy Sue, since she came off the track. And it's really gratifying to have a mayor like that so long and then raise a stallion prospect. We raised Liam's map for him. He's gotten off to a good start. Now, not this time. The younger brother is, um, you know, he looks like that uh, sky's the limit. But we know it's he's got a long way to go. Um, what we do know is he's a beautiful horse himself. He had really elite level talent and now his babies are showing that they can run. But, you know, uh, still we're in the we're in the first four miles of a marathon. So we uh, you know, we're just hoping that it keeps going. And Mark, you guys have had stallions for a number of years. And obviously this one is a homebred, you know, from from the time it was conceived all the way up until you sold it uh, or until it went to the races, I should say. Um, it, were those the main reasons why you felt so strongly to pick him up as a stallion prospect? Because if you look at the giant causeways that stand at stud in the United States, you know, there's about two dozen of them, but only a handful, only like three or four of them stand for more than $10,000 that, that, that we consider them to be viable stallions. So take the audience through the process of why it made sense to be a stallion prospect in Kentucky and specifically for TaylorMade. So it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, we we have limited resources. We don't we're not billionaires. You know, every dollar that we've made uh, that we have has been generated through the horse business. It's like we don't have any outside source of income. So we have to be very judicious and um, and we have to try to find value when we're we're getting a stallion. So if you look at the four brothers, it's an interesting dynamic where. Um, Duncan is the pedigree guy, right? Duncan is pedigree. He wants the bloodlines. He sits there and he's one of those guys that is up late at night, burning the candle, studying some six cross and, you know, who it goes back to and all that stuff. Um, you know, Frank and I are confirmation guys. We, we got to have a good looking horse. If they're not good looking, we don't care how much Duncan likes the pedigree. We're, we're downplaying the horse. And then everybody appreciates a brilliant racehorse on the team. So, you know, with this horse, even though he never won a grade one, you know, the talent was very clear that he had grade one talent. He, he ran a huge race in the Breeders' Cup uh, Juvenile. Um, he actually ran a, a better number, I believe, uh, than the winner in that race. And so we knew the talent was there. Unfortunately, he got hurt. Um, and Duncan loves the pedigree. I remember when Duncan told me we're definitely getting the horse. My first inclination was, man, the stallion market's tough. He's not a grade one winner. Uh, are we going to struggle with this horse? And then Duncan went on about a 15 minute uh, rant about his pedigree. And he loves Miss Macy Sue. Miss Macy Sue is just, uh, he talks about that mare all the time. And he loved the way Liam's map was bred. Um, and he just thought, forget who not this, not this time is by, forget Giants Causeway. Just the pedigree pattern that he's bred on the female family of Miss Macy Sue. Um, you know, you got to go after this horse. So that's that's kind of the genesis of how it happened. And we had a Skenderea at our farm. You know, we had stood another son of Giants Causeway who uh, was a bigger profile horse coming in, ultimately was sold back to Japan. But it, it, he's probably one of the better sons of Giants Causeway over. He came up with quite a few good horses, um, you know, more spirit, uh, Matoli. Uh, Isabella sings. I mean, he, he was a he was a useful horse, uh, but he wasn't. He didn't quite do enough to sustain it. So, and then I'm rambling, but going all the way back, we have a real appreciation for Giants Causeway, 
we sold him in utero. We sold his mother, Mariah Storm, for two point six million um, to Coolmore, and we've always loved that horse. And we love Giants Causeway broodmares. So even though he hadn't had a son really get it done over here, he's had Shamardal and other horses in Europe. You know, we had definitely not given up on him. Hey, Mark, good to see you. How you been? Great, Alan. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Um, and going back to what you said about the foreign participation, um, Korean buyers and, uh, well, to a, less, to a lesser extent, the Japanese buyers helped to, to strengthen that no market as bidders and underbidders. Do you see that continuing into the yearling sales as well? Well, what I'm hopeful of is that um, we can get some um, positive news on the COVID front, you know, which every day it's a different story, you know, it's up and down. But um, I think if we can get some more confidence and some travel restrictions eased, I really hope that we can get, um, you know, if you look at Keelan September in particular, I mean, their buying bench is just filled with international people. I mean, I, I give them credit for really developing that market uh, and having such a, a great representation from all over the globe. So, you know, I think it's too early to tell, you know, there's some places that are really struggling in South America, you know, they've had an uptick in Asia and a few places. Um, so it's really too early to tell, but I'm cautiously optimistic that we're going to get uh, people over here. I think the demand is there internationally. Um, and maybe since they couldn't buy as many two-year-olds, they would have a little bit more of an appetite to jump in stronger in the yearling market if we can get them here and make uh, buying, you know, with internet bidding and that, that kind of thing. So I'm hopeful that um, that we can get them involved. Wanted to talk about uh, uh, a syndication, a partnership that you guys are involved with, Medallion Racing. Um, can you tell the audience what was the genesis of that and basically how it works, how many partners you guys usually take on, price points, all that stuff, the response you've gotten, what, what is the deal with Medallion Racing and, and how it's going? Okay, so Medallion, uh, we started that uh, kind of on the heels of, um, you know, California Chrome. When we, uh, when we were racing California Chrome, a lot of our friends and customers, they jumped in and bought shares, but then they became racehorse owners, some of them for the first time, um, because the horse continued to run. Um, and they had obviously great experience. Um, but what it kind of turned the light bulb on for us is at, at our core at TaylorMade, we're really a service company. You know, customer service is really uh, what we're all about. And, and we have great horsemen and we have a lot of experience in that area. Uh, and we can do a lot of other things, but whatever we do is kind of wrapped in the tailor-made customer service package. So what I think we were able to do with California Chrome is give that experience and give this awesome experience to a lot of people. Uh, we met a lot of people on that ride. Then we ended up parlaying that. We bought into Catherine Sophia before she won the Oaks and she had a great year. And that, so it kind of sparked this thing that we need a vehicle to bring new people into the game um, or a vehicle for people that are maybe in the game at a lower level that they want to experience really high level of racing. So um, what we came up with was let's get a model. We're going to do exclusively fillies. Uh, so we have some built-in residual value. Um, another criteria we have is the horse has already has to have shown stakes ability. They either have already gotten black type in a stake or they've run numbers that you're like, yeah, if this horse stays sound, they're definitely a stake horse. So um, then we try to get any pedigree we can is great. Um, and we try to, uh, we buy in to the horse. We never buy 100% of anything. So we try to take the money raised and spread it over a wide swath of horses where if one gets hurt or one needs time off, we always have action and we have fillies running. So, um, you know, the first, um, the first go around that we did, uh, we ended up having a total of 14 fillies in there. Uh, we raised uh, in that particular fund, it was about a million two. And after all was said and done, people, we ran in 20 grade one races. Uh, we won a grade one. We won uh, three grade twos. We had a ton of fun. I mean, there were some really uh, great horses in that group. And when everybody cashed out and they sold out, uh, they lost about 5%, right? So 
if you take the the ownership experience, what they were able to do and all these graded stakes, and if you put up um, 50 grand as the minimum, uh, you ended up losing 2,500 bucks. So it was $1,250 a year. It was a two year thing. So, you know, we, the way we look at it is, you know, those, those results, you don't know if they're, they're able to be duplicated, but we're not selling this as a, a profit thing. Like everything else we do, we're trying to make our customers money with this. We're trying to be, um, we're trying to give great, great experiences and let you taste running in and winning graded stakes. And if we can do that with either uh, monetarily neutral or maybe gain a little bit of money, but we're not promising that, you know, you might lose, you could lose 25%, you could make 25%. But if we can hit that middle bar, I just think it's great value. And it's a great way for people, a lot of, I've gotten people in on other uh, partnerships. And if you buy a yearling or you buy a two-year-old in training or whatever, and then the horse doesn't run for a long time or they get hurt, people get Dis, disillusioned or they kind of check out, they kind of forget about it, whatever. So with this model, we're able to get enough action in graded stakes where I think engagement's really high and people have enjoyed it. So um, we're in our second round now. We've got a lot of nice horses. We've got Bo Recall, who's running in the Gamely next week, uh, next weekend. We expect her to run big. Um, we've got Street Band, who won a grade one uh, for us last year. Um, and, um, you know, we've totally, we've got about eight horses in there right now and they're all running at a, at a high level. They're all great at stake horses. So anyway, we're, uh, we're going to reload again this year. This year's like our funding year. So going into the fall, we're going to start taking new investors and do the same model all over again. So it's worked out well. We'll keep tweaking it as we go, but it's been a lot of fun. Mark, one of the things that we talk to people in the industry about, especially in the breeding industry, is this new 140 mare cap that the Jockey Club is implementing, um, starting with this fall crop. Two part question. Number one is, you know, how involved were you in coming up with the, the discussions of the 140 mare cap? Um, and number two, what's your as a stallion owner, what's your insight on it? So <clears throat> we weren't very involved at all, um, but. I'll say this, you know, it's a, it's a very volatile issue. It's a lightning rod issue. People feel strongly on both ways about it. And the, the pure capitalists are, you know, they cringe at the thought that you're, you're controlling or you're uh, trying to tell people how to run their business. And normally I, I feel like I would fall into that camp of people. But in this particular situation, uh, I see the value and the benefits of it more than I see um, the downside. So, I can, my dad started out in standard breads with Clarence Gaines, um, who was one of the biggest, you know, standard bread players at his, of his time in the fifties and sixties. Um, and then he brand, my dad branched off with John Gaines, but my dad had a, a standard bread background. And I can remember numerous dinners sitting around with he and Mr. Gaines, and they would always say, Oh, you know, we can never let them put in artificial insemination in, in thoroughbreds. It's really killed the standard bread game um, because, hey, st standard bread guys are breeding 100 mares these days. You know, this is back in the 70s and 80s, right? So fast forward now because of science and what we're able to do with controlling mares ovulation and just everything that's going on, you know, without artificial insemination, we're breeding over twice as many as what those guys thought was really saturating and having problems in the market. So. I don't want to ramble too long, but let me give you just a couple things that I think people may not think about when they do this. Um, you know, when you're trying to book a mare to one of these stallions that's got um, 180, 200, 225, whatever the red, you're having to call two and a half weeks before you think the mare might possibly be in heat. And then they are just moving you around in this queue trying to get your spot. And it's total guesswork, right? And so what happens is a lot of times you don't get the spot you need because everybody's trying to get the same day, whatever. So a lot of mares don't get in foal. Then you get a backlog for that stallion. They get jammed up and it, it just kind of snowballs and it's creating a lot of inefficiency on getting the mares in foal. So that's just one thing. I think second thing is um, when you go, and now this is a unique insight that I might have uh, as a consigner more than as a stallion master. But, you know, when I catalog our consignment for September and you look at the stat where last year, 15 stallions 
uh, were responsible for 75% of book one. It just, it goes to show you how difficult that is for a breeder to survive. I mean, you go in there and just every barn has the same thing over and over and over again. And if you don't fall in the, in the very top echelon of that, it's hard and it's just, it makes cataloging the sale. Sometimes there's very little difference between two offspring of a stallion as far as their dams are concerned. They're basically the same, but one is a B plus when you're cataloging it in June. The other one is a B to B plus. It's a half letter grade less as far as confirmation and physicality goes. So, you know, one, where do you put them? One goes in book one, one goes in book three, but then they flip flop uh, and people pass over the one that's in book one because they've heard there's better ones coming later. I just think there's too much saturation. Um, Now, I also think that if you look at some of our best stallions uh, in the market, they got a chance because um, they there were enough mares to go around. You know, distorted humor climbed his way up. Uh, Tappet didn't start off as the fanciest, highest level horse. You know, horse we had like St. Bellato climbed up from 3,500. You know, there's a lot of these horses that would never even get a shot in Kentucky, especially now. So I don't think that that's good because as we've learned over history, the most brilliant racehorse is not always the best stallion. Sometimes they just come out of nowhere. I mean, into mischief, was a very good stallion. He was a great one, or a very good racehorse, but he wasn't the one that was just the no brainer. Um, so that's my two cents worth. And I'm sure my phone will blow up by people who, you know, the one argument is Japan's going to buy all the good stallions because they're going to be able to breed as many as they want to. Um, we're going to be handcuffed and we're not going to be able to afford to pay as much money. So I understand that. And if that starts happening, you know, we may learn from a mistake and we might try unravel it later. But um, I do think we need some more diversity. And um, I just think it's unhealthy all the way around uh, for the market, for the horse to a certain degree. Um, And, uh, you know, I'm glad they changed it. I might not have gone to 140. If it was up to me, I might have, you know, I think if you went to 160 or something, that would have been okay. Uh, really what's tough is the ones that are breeding north of 200 and you know there's that's getting to be more common all the time i I just wanted to ask that you you can't mention or have a conversation with tailor-made guy without uh, bringing up on broad songs uh great stallion 22 grade one winners and even better broodmare sire just uh broodmare sire of the japanese derby winner but can you reflect on your time with on broad song at, at your farm and what he meant to your farm well, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> he meant the world to us and just um, he really kind of uh, helped transform TaylorMade. And, you know, if you look at it, it was almost divine providence that we ended up with this horse. Um, you know, he was he was on our farm as a baby. We were uh, doing a dispersal for Mandy's lamb. We couldn't get him sold. Um, he was an RNA, came back to the farm that he ended up getting sold later. Um, so we don't consign him at Saratoga. He goes to, con- he goes to Saratoga, Buzz Chase, Buzz Chase picks him out for Ernie Perigallo, sends him back to Taylor made to lay up for a while before he goes down to Bob Scanlon's. And we were looking at him and we were just like, oh my gosh, this horse is unbelievable. And, and my dad had a long connection with the Ginner family and unbridled from his days at Gainesway. So we were big unbridled people. Um, so we were very enamored with this horse. And then he goes down there. And does his thing. Bob Scanlon's telling me like this is the best horse he's ever had. And Bob Scanlon been around a lot of good horses. Um, goes to the two year old sale, and um, <laughs> you know, we sell him for them world record at the two year old sale, a uh, million two, unbelievable. I remember the announcer said the the trees swayed when he worked. And so then we're all celebrating. The only place that's open is the Waffle House. We're like high five, and we set a world record. It's our first two year old sale we've ever sold at. Blah blah blah. Phone rings. Uh, they want to turn him back. They found a chip and a hind ankle. So when he died, um, you know, 18 years later, he still had that chip in the hind ankle. It never, never was taken out, never hurt him. But um, he was an incredible horse um, and, um, you know, came there. And he was a horse that just did everything you could ever want a horse to do at every stage of his life. I mean, his babies were awesome. The market loved him. He got brilliant horses. Even when he went through a decade-long persecution of people saying, oh, they're unsound, they're unsound, they're unsound, 
people still couldn't help themselves. When you went to the sale, the same guy who had been saying, I'll never buy another one, they go out there and you look on the results sheet and they just bought another one. So anyway, he got better as his life went on. I mean, his best Colts came in like his last three or four crops. Uh, Arrogate, Will Take Charge, uh, Gradar, just list goes on and on. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm very hopeful that maybe Arrogate, even though he had an abbreviated stud career, can, uh, can make his stamp as a stallion. That was the one uh, place he missed on his resume. But his daughters are fantastic. Um, just a great horse. Um, and, um, you know, very lucky to have them. And, and even the California Chrome that brought seven and a quarter uh, down at OBS, you know, he's out of a um, out of an unbridled song mare. So just anyway, super horse. I hope uh, he's a once in a lifetime kind of horse for us. I hope maybe we get one more before we check out. But we're, we're still fingers crossed. His legacy is cemented, I think, for sure. And I think Arrogate's only going to add to that Liam's map. I, I think that that's only going to grow. Um, one more question before we let you get out of here. I wanted to get your take on uh, the cooperation that we've seen and the consolidation that we've seen in the yearling sales. Uh, obviously, the FASIC tipped in, pushing all of their sales into one and doing it a week apart from Keeneland. Um, I think it's great. I think we think it's great to see that kind of cooperation in an industry that doesn't really have a lot of it. But I was wondering from a seller's and from a consigner's standpoint, whether or not you think that maybe doesn't give you as much of a chance to be in the spotlight on different days. How do you feel about those sale positions? Well, I totally agree with what you said about how great it is that the cooperation happened. Um, even, you know, I think it, even beyond just the timing of the sales and how they're, you know, I know Phasing Tipton had offered to Keeneland if you need our facility on some of the days because of logistics. Um, that they they offered that up. Um, I think that, you know, that was just fantastic. And I think uh, in tough times, you see our industry come together. They've even worked together behind the scenes, um, hiring the same consultants to work on the, the protocols for safety. Uh, so we're going to have seamless protocols. You know, it's not like you're going to go to Phasic Tipton and you're going to have one set of protocols and then you go to Keeneland a few days later and it's whole, totally different. So Phasic and Keeneland got on the same page. They hired the same uh, firm to work together with that. So once we get people kind of used to it at Phasic, they'll seamlessly be able to roll over to Keeneland September. Um, I think as far as it is different, you know, you always think in your mind about a horse you want to take to Saratoga that you think this is the kind of horse we want to take there. It might appeal to some of those unique buyers that show up at Saratoga that are uh, live in New York, a race in New York, and maybe you want to take a pedigree that fits that. The July sale was unfortunately canceled. You have early maturing horses that you like to take there. So um, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting, and it's not going to be easy. Um, we're we're going to earn our stripes this year, uh, trying to serve our customers and take care of everybody and get these horses sold in the best way we can. But uh, I think it's going to be good. I think um, that we're going to have. Um, I'm glad at the end of the day, I think Phasing was looking at some dates, maybe right after the Derby and there was going to be a longer gap. And then they rethought that. Um, I know Pat Payne in our office was a real proponent of let's get them closer together. So people aren't feeling like they might have to leave Kentucky and then come back to Kentucky. Let's just make it all one continuous, uh, flow. So I think it's going to be good. And I, I, I commend, uh, everyone at Keeneland and everyone at Phasing Tipton for sort of putting down their competitive uh, hats and saying, hey, let's just work together and uh, try to do what's right for the buyers and sellers. Mark, we can't thank you enough for the time and uh, all the, uh, the, how generous you were with your time. Congratulations on the early success of Not This Time. Uh, we're, all, we're all pretty excited about him, I think, and the Miss Macy Sue family and all that. So thanks for the time, Mark. Best of luck the rest of the year and uh, appreciate it. Okay, thanks a lot. I appreciate what you guys are doing. I think this whole uh, podcast is fantastic. I hear great things about it on a regular basis. And um, I think it's a really uh, great way for people to tune in and, and engage with current topics. And uh, so keep up the good work. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Thank you. Mark. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks. All right. See you. Be well. Bye. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Mark Taylor will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more on how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from the Green Group. 
The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. All right, so before we get out of here this week, uh, I just wanted to give a pop to, uh, I guess, Len Green. John doesn't want any credit for it. Um, but Len Green, DJ Stable, John's dad, he's a, he's, a, he's a friend of the show, obviously, and then a friend of the TVN. He writes a, a fairly regular tax advice column. He's, he, he's the king of the Green Group, and he had a uh, he won an award from Monmouth Park, the Virgil Buddy Reigns Distinguished Achievement Award. Obviously, a longtime supporter of Monmouth Park and New Jersey racing and uh, want to extend congrats to, to Len and the whole Green family. So that's 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 a big deal. And, and we're, we're happy to have them, you know, in our state and in our sport. Uh, John, any any thoughts on and don't use it for self-promotion. I know how you love to do that. Talk about your dad. <laughs> well, it, it's very humbling for me um, because, you know, my parents especially have have raced at Monmouth Park for four decades. And that really is our home racetrack. I mean, we've, we've won more races there than anywhere else in the world. And um, it'll always hold a very special uh, you know place in our hearts for it. So for my dad to win the award um, when some really illustrious horsemen have, have won that award as well, you know, ranging from uh, John Forbes and Benny Perkins and uh, Joel Kligman and, and Evie Novak, Dennis Drazen. I mean, the list goes on and on. So for him to be held in that esteem um, really meant a lot to him and meant a lot to us as a family. Um, and also, it's going to be great to see his face on the wall at Monmouth Park every time we go there, uh, because we're you know once they start allowing fans to to, uh, to come in again, um, it's going to be wonderful to see him you know be a part of the history of Monmouth Park. And Monmouth Park has been a rich part of our family history. Um, for a number of years. And, uh, you know, I just I can't thank them enough for recognizing uh, my dad. And, and I know that out of all the he's had a very illustrious career, he's been very fortunate. He's won awards um, in various different businesses. But this one in particular really resonated with him um, and made him almost speechless, which is almost as tough to do as making me speechless. So thank you guys for, for recognizing. I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, well done, well done to Len, well deserved, and uh, we look forward to seeing the DJ Stable Silks back at Monmouth this summer, and uh, you know, in the future at all sorts of great racetracks. Um, so we appreciate, and we appreciate the, the Green Group support as well. So uh, hats off to Len for sure. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Remember, Keeneland will conduct an online select horses at Racing Age sale next Tuesday, June 23rd in the Keeneland Digital Sales Ring. Learn more at keenelanddigital.com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, Alan Carrasso, our Green Group guest of the week, Mark Taylor, our producer, Patty Wolf, our editor, Anthony LaRocca, and our production coordinator, Shel Sabrino. Thanks so much for watching. Stay safe out there. We'll see you next week. <laughs>